Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, and welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is our fourth annual Carl Rinney Initiative Lecture, and we're so happy about that. Um, I know that many of you are here because you, you've been part of the initiative. You come to our support groups or other educational events. Um, but for those of you who don't know much about the initiative, um, I do want to mention a little bit about it. Um, the Rini Louis Body Dementia Initiative started in 2016, um, and it was founded by Tamara Real. And Tamara founded the initiative um, after caring for her husband, Carl. You can see them both on the banner right next to the screen there. Um, and Tamara um, cared for her husband, Carl, who, who passed away with Louis Body Dementia in 2013. Um, Tamara's unfortunately not with us anymore, but any of you who know Tamara know about her persistence and her dedication to educating the community on Lewy body dementia. So um, we're happy at the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center to um, take that on for her, and um, we're happy to have events like this to educate people and to um, do it across the state. That was her um, initiative. The three goals of the initiative are to support families and those living with the disease, to educate healthcare professionals, and to spread awareness across Michigan. So um, we're honored at the center to, ho to house the initiative. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Armstrong, who comes to us from sunny Florida um, and is very happy that it's not snowing here in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Armstrong is the director of the Mangerian Clinical Research Headquarters for Lewy Body and Parkinson's Disease Dementia at the University of Florida. She also serves on the LBDA's Scientific Advisory Council, and Dr. Armstrong's LBD research focuses on the lived experience of the disease for individuals with LBD and their families, ranging from patient and caregiver priorities for care to hospital outcomes and end-of-life experiences. And I know she'll be talking a lot about that today. So join me in welcoming her. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. So today, we're going to kind of divide the talk into two parts. And so for the first part, we're going to talk about Lewy body dementia basics. And that's for people in the room who may be new to this, but I also start most of my talks about Lewy body dementia with some of those basics, especially about vocabulary, because the vocabulary is really a mess. And so that causes a lot of confusion, not only amongst people living with the disease, but also medical professionals, physicians, it's really confusing. And so I always like to start by making sure that we're all talking about the same things. And after that initial introduction, then the rest of the talk today will focus about uh, ideas about hospitalization and Lewy body dementia, what happens, why might you be in the hospital, and how can you prepare for that. So when we think about Lewy body dementia, I first start with that term dementia. And dementia is really an umbrella term. And all dementia means, so it's a medical term, and it just means that you have changes in your memory and thinking that are a decline from prior. So it's a change, and that those changes are now affecting your day-to-day -day life. Now, even physicians kind of debate, well, how much does it have to affect your day-to-day -day life to be called a dementia? And there's still some debate there, but this general idea is that your memory and thinking aren't as good as they used to be, and it's affecting your day-to-day -day life. And there are a lot of different things under that dementia umbrella. So in the United States, the most common dementia is Alzheimer's disease dementia. And so that's the, the one we all hear about most commonly. If you go just by, by numbers, number two would be vascular cognitive impairment. That's memory problems relating to stroke. But the number three overall, and the number two, if you think about brain diseases causing memory and thinking problems, is Lewy body dementia. But Lewy body dementia itself is an umbrella term. And there are two different ways that you might be called Lewy body dementia. One is dementia with Lewy bodies, and one is Parkinson's disease dementia. And we're going to dig a little bit more into that. How are they different? How are they the same? 
And I totally admit, so some of you are thinking, sitting here probably thinking, that's really dumb. Like you've got dementia with Lewy bodies and Lewy body dementia, and they're different. And it is kind of dumb, but that, that's the way it is. Um, and so it's good to know that this Lewy body dementia, there are multiple paths to get there. So when we think about this umbrella term of Lewy body dementia, this affects almost a million and a half people in the United States. And that is probably an underestimate because we think that one in three people with dementia with Lewy bodies are never diagnosed at all. And of the people who get the diagnosis, it often takes many years to get the right diagnosis. So we definitely have a problem with getting the, the correct diagnosis and getting it quickly. And definitely we need some of that awareness that we were talking about. So when we think of dementia with Lewy bodies, usually people with dementia with Lewy bodies have some memory and thinking problems right up front. They also have fluctuations where there may be moments where you or your loved ones are you know, alert, pretty much your old self, and then other times where you are completely out of it or where you may look over at your loved one and be like, hello, hello. So these ups and downs are very characteristic. People with dementia with Lewy bodies can have, fluc have hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there very early. You can have Parkinson's problems, but you don't have to have Parkinson's problems to have dementia with Lewy bodies. And then there are also other common symptoms like the blood pressure getting low and getting dizzy, constipation, urinary symptoms. Now with Parkinson's disease dementia, many people with Parkinson's disease dementia will have Parkinson's for many years before the memory and thinking problems start. And that means they have kind of a, a different experience. So maybe they got Parkinson's in their 50s or 60s. They were still working. It was mostly physical. They were shaking. They may have, over time, gotten on more and more medications for the Parkinson's. Maybe they're on five different things, ups and downs. Maybe they have the deep brain stimulation. And only after many years of the Parkinson's do they develop the memory and thinking problems. So those, tend, those memory and thinking problems tend to occur later in people who have the Parkinson's disease before the dementia, and they may or may not have the visual hallucinations. Usually they have some of those autonomic symptoms too, like the constipation and the urinary problems. Well, the reason these two things are grouped is not only because they share similar symptoms, though maybe in a different order, but also because they have the same thing happening in the brain. So people often say, you know, what's causing my dementia with Lewy bodies? What's causing my Parkinson's? And we have a partial answer to that. So we know that we all have this protein in the brain called alpha-synuclein. Now this isn't a protein that you eat. It's one that we all have, and we really have no idea what it does, but it's in our brains. And that upper picture there, the rainbow, is kind of what it looks like. So we don't know what it does, but for some reason, in people with dementia with Lewy bodies and with Parkinson's, it clumps. And when it clumps, it forms these Lewy bodies. So this is what it looks like under the microscope. And when those Lewy bodies accumulate, they, they kind of grow in the cells, you get more and more, then those parts of the brain die and they don't work as well. Now, so we know that this is the problem, but we don't really know why it happens. So that's why I say we have a partial answer. Why did you get this? Well, you've got these clumps, but we don't know why this protein is clumping in you and not in someone else. We do know some things that make it easier. So it's if you're older, it's easier. Uh, sometimes genetics can play a role. If it's in your family, it might be a bit easier. If you're a man, these diseases are more common in men. They're more common if you had a head injury, like when you were a child, or if you had certain exposures, certain toxins, some, some pesticides, um, some solvents. And then there are also things that seem a bit protective. So it seems a little odd, but if you smoked, you have a lower risk. We don't recommend that as a strategy, but that's what the research suggests. If you drink caffeine, you have a lower risk. And if you exercise, let's go with that one, if you exercise, you have a lower risk. So there's a lot we don't understand 
about why this is happening, even if we know what's happening if we look at your brain after you die. Now, one of the big challenges here is that we have absolutely no way to see this in your brain when you're alive. So there's no MRI scan or PET scan or blood test that we can use right now to see these clumps. And so we really rely on talking to you, examining you, and learning about what's happening with you in order to make these diagnoses. But one of the big reasons, not just the overlapping clinical features, but one of the reasons these two diseases go together is because when we look at your brain after you die, it's pretty much the exact same thing. There are some debates about whether it's exactly the same or very similar, but either way, we know it's almost the same process, if not the same process in the brain uh, when people with these diseases die. So how are they overlapping? Dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. Well, we just talked about it. What's happening in the brain is overlapping. And then there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms themselves. So those Parkinson movement problems, the memory and thinking changes, hallucinations, especially seeing things that aren't there, those ups and downs, sleep changes like trouble falling asleep, being too sleepy during the day or acting out your dreams when you sleep, that low blood pressure, the constipation, and other symptoms. These are in both diseases. But there are some differences. So sometimes the age at which these things start can differ. So both these diseases get more common as you get older. But Parkinson's, I think, on average starts a little bit younger for some people, um, while for others it'll start very late in life. What symptoms come first is really the biggest difference, I would say. And that goes back to what we talked about on an earlier slide, where in dementia with Lewy bodies, those memory and thinking problems are usually the big problem right up front. Whereas some people with Parkinson's will have the movement problems for many years before the memory and thinking problems. And so that means kind of your, your experiences will be very different. You know, with, with dementia with Lewy bodies, things happen out of the blue. You know, what's hap this is all very new. Whereas if you've had Parkinson's for five years or 10 years or 15 years, your doctors may say, be looking for those memory and thinking problems or may tell you that they're coming, you know what to expect. What symptoms are most bothersome can also differ between the two diseases. So with dementia with Lewy bodies, they may have no Parkinson's symptoms or the Parkinson's symptoms may be mostly walking or a little bit of slowness. Whereas people who've had Parkinson's for 10 years may have you know, the tremor and the stiffness and the slowness and the dyskinesias, the extra movements from the medications. Um, uh, with both of them, some people have hallucinations, some don't. The medications that are used can be different, and that has to do too with how long you've had the problem and what the biggest problems are. So in dementia with Lewy bodies, if people have Parkinson-like symptoms, I usually myself only use carbidopa levodopa, the Cinemet, because generally that's the safest medication we have for Parkinson's with the least risk of side effects, especially in people who are older and have problems like hallucinations and low blood pressure. Now, if you've had Parkinson's for five or 10 years and you're younger, you may be on a lot of different Parkinson's medicines. The carbidopa levodopa, Medications called uh, dopamine agonists like Mirapex and Requip. Sometimes people use medicines specifically for tremor. But all those other medications that you might use for Parkinson's physical symptoms cause a lot more problems if you're already hallucinating or already have low blood pressure. And so the types of medicines that have been used for the physical symptoms may differ at different points in the disease. And then how many people, how many years that people live with the disease will, will differ. People now can live with Parkinson's 20, 30 years or more, depending on their health and how young they were when they got it, whereas usually people with dementia with Lewy bodies don't live that long. So there are a lot of similarities, but also some differences. So that's the basic intro that I wanted to give about Lewy body dementia in general. And now we're gonna to transition to talking about 
emergency rooms, hospitalizations, how to prepare, and things that you should know. So the first thing I want to talk about when we talk about what to think about with hospitalization is another medical term. And this is a medical term called delirium. And delirium is kind of a temporary change in your memory and thinking. Usually it's provoked by something, being in the hospital, an infection, being sick from something else, sometimes medications. And when people are delirious, there is a lot of overlap with the symptoms with dementia with Lewy bodies. So if you're delirious, you'll have ups and downs with how aware you are, confused one moment, alert the next moment. You can have hallucinations. You can be confused. You might not recognize where you are. But with delirium, it's temporary and usually provoked by something. Now, when we think about hospitalization and Lewy body dementia, I'm going to take a step back for a moment till before when you or your loved one was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. So we know that delirium in the hospital or with an infection can actually be for some people the first sign of Lewy body dementia. So in people with dementia with Lewy bodies, there's some research suggests that if you were delirious in the hospital, that that might be the first sign of dementia with Lewy bodies and that you might not get that dementia with Lewy bodies till years later. Or sometimes the delirium is the first sign that something's wrong. So, or maybe, you know, you kind of knew things weren't quite right. Maybe memory and thinking weren't quite as good as they used to be, but hadn't really seemed like a big deal. Someone was a little slow, but hadn't really gotten to big enough deal to go see the doctor yet. And then you ended up in the hospital for some reason and everything fell apart. So you or your loved one was completely delirious, gradually got through it, but never quite got back to where you used to be. And then you end up seeing the neurologist and getting diagnosed with dementia with Lewy bodies. And so it's not uncommon that people tell me that it was kind of a hospital that was the, the trigger for things getting worse. And that initial diagnosis was only made after a hospitalization. Or in people with Parkinson's disease, you know, I, I definitely have patients with Parkinson's disease who go into the hospital. Memory and thinking don't seem like they're a huge deal, but they're not quite normal. They've never hallucinated before. They need a surgery. And then after the surgery, it's just a mess. So they're, they're delirious. Uh, they're hallucinating, they have a prolonged recovery in the hospital, and they never quite get back to where they were before. And that's when we start wondering about the Parkinson's disease dementia. And so while all my other slides are going to focus on what you should be thinking about, you already have this diagnosis or your loved one has this diagnosis, why might you be in the hospital, what can you do about it, I think it's helpful to recognize that there are probably some people in this room who were diagnosed after a hospitalization. That seemed to be the trigger for everything getting worse, and that's when uh, the diagnosis was first recognized. And we don't really know how often a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies or of Parkinson's disease dementia is made after a hospitalization. That hasn't really been researched, but we definitely see that all the time in clinic. So now, thinking of Lewy body dementia, most people in this room will either have this themselves or are here with a loved one. So this research I have on the slide was done by Dr. Galvin. He was one of your prior speakers. And he did a survey of almost 1,000 caregivers of people with Lewy body dementia. And he asked them, have you had a crisis situation in the last year? And 64% of the caregivers said yes. And then he asked them, okay, you have a crisis situation. Where are you getting help? And almost 75% of them said the place where they get help is an emergency room. And then less commonly, it would be from law enforcement or needing an inpatient uh, psychiatric admission. So if you look at those numbers, you have to think that this is a pretty common topic. So 64% of people were reporting a crisis in the last year, and most of them were going to the ER. So this is something you may face. This is something that is common. 
Uh, now, this slide just tells you that most of my subsequent slides are going to be from one of these three studies, and, I, and I'll I usually call out which study I'm referring to. So we did a study at University of Florida, and then Dr. Spears, who's the first author, he's now here at the University of Michigan, and we looked at why people with Lewy body dementia were hospitalized in Florida, and then what happened. And there are also a couple of other publications I'll be referencing. Uh, one is out of England and one is out of Taiwan. And the reason I mention that is just because healthcare across the world is really different. And so some of the experiences in these other countries will be similar and some of them will be different. And so I think it's important, I think these other studies have information to speak to what we may see here in the US, but all of our contexts are a little bit different. So why might you get admitted to the hospital? What are the most common reasons that people with Lewy body dementia are admitted to the hospital and have to stay? And I think one of the striking things is that across these three studies, even though they're in different years in different places, the most common things are very similar. So hallucinations, a worsening of hallucinations and confusion were the number one reasons that people were admitted to the hospital in two of the three studies and accounted for almost 40% of the times people were admitted to the hospital. Another common one that was in the top numbers for each of the studies was falls. Now, the, the range of falls varied widely, and that might have to depend on whether someone just fell or did they break something, how did they count that, but falls were a common reason. Infection was a really common reason that people got admitted, and those were pretty consistently among the top three. So worsening of hallucinations and confusion falls and infection. And when people with Lewy body dementia get infected, it's often easy to get confused. So some of that may go together. Now, in some ways, this is really discouraging because these are things that we know relate to Lewy body dementia in the cases of hallucinations and falls or can make the Lewy body dementia worse in the case of infection. But they're things that are really hard to prevent. So most of you in the room probably know we don't have great medications for hallucinations. We use physical therapy to try to prevent falls, but we don't have great ways to prevent falls. And so some of what this tells us is we really need better medications to help the symptoms that people experience with Lewy body dementia. But it's also helpful to know, okay, you know, so these are the top three things. Are there ways we can be proactive about trying to be more aggressive about managing hallucinations in clinic, trying to prevent the need for hospitalization in some of these circumstances? Now, even though the top few things often relate to Lewy body dementia, we know that even though you have Lewy body dementia, it doesn't stop you from getting any other kind of medical problem. And so people with Lewy body dementia can have heart attacks or strokes. Um, or they, you might need to get surgery, even though we try to avoid it if we can. And so it's always a challenge just because you have Lewy body dementia doesn't mean you can't get something else too. So now you're in the hospital for some reason, what is going to happen? And I think this is helpful to know to think about so that if you or your loved one is in the hospital, you have some idea of what to expect. So when we looked at people admitted uh, to the University of Florida over two years, we found that most of them were only admitted the one time. But about 30% had multiple hospitalizations over that two-year period. And for about 10%, it was three or more hospitalizations. So while most it's one and done, uh, there are people with Lewy body dementia where you just keep getting admitted. And we, when we looked at, well, if you, if you were readmitted, if you needed that two to four, so the seven and eight, those were the outliers. But if you had multiple admissions over the two years, what did those seem to relate to? Most of the time, it was those things related to the Lewy body dementia. So confusion, hallucinations, failure to thrive. That's when you're just not really doing very well and your family doesn't know how to help you're not eating, you're not drinking, you're just, you're just not living as well as you used to. 
falls, and then also passing out, which can relate to the low blood pressure. Um, and then infection is just really common. And our data was pretty similar to that study out of Taiwan, where they averaged about two, two and a half admissions over a four-year period. And infection and falls were the most common reasons people had repeat admissions, and then also heart problems. Uh, when we looked at Florida, and I would imagine that it would be a similar experience here at the University of Michigan, most people with Lewy body dementia were not admitted to neurology services, but they were taken care of by medicine doctors. Um, and when people were admitted to the medicine teams, only about a third of the time were e was either neurology or psychiatry involved. Now, this is possibly a way that we could improve how we can take care of you in the hospital, because as I'm sure a lot of you have experienced, and as some of us discussed over lunch, a lot of doctors don't know about Lewy body dementia. Um, and so this is a really common problem, not just at community hospitals, but also at academic centers. And so if you have a loved one who's in the hospital and your team just doesn't seem to know about Lewy body dementia, at least based on our experience, this is a way that we could potentially improve care because in our review, a lot of people with Lewy body didn't have a neurologist involved. Now, in some ways, if your Lewy body is stable, maybe you don't need a neurologist to weigh in when you're in the hospital, but it's very common that being in the hospital can make you more confused. And so having a neurologist help and guide on the medications that, that your team should use can sometimes be helpful. So we looked at this in, in our, over our two years about if people with Lewy body dementia were in the hospital, what happened? And we found that in about half of people with Lewy body dementia, they got more confused and they hallucinated more when they were in the hospital. And this is just really common because it's a strange place. The nurses are waking you up at all times of the day and night. You know, they're, they're drawing blood at 3 a.m. It's noisy. You know, so there are a lot of reasons that being in the hospital can be really confusing. I was actually surprised that only half got more confused in the hospital, and it may be that, you know, we were looking at what the doctors documented, so maybe they didn't write it down, but it was happening. 17% of people with Lewy body dementia got pneumonia when they were in the hospital. Maybe they were confused and not swallowing as well and swallowed the wrong way, and 5% fell while they were in the hospital. And not surprisingly, if one of these complications happened, people ended up being in the hospital for longer. We found that most people with Lewy body dementia, the average or the median is kind of another way to say average, was about five days with a really wide range. Some people were just there overnight. Someone with cancer was there for 72 days. It's a little shorter than they found in the England study where they found that people were hospitalized about 10 days a year or in Taiwan, it was 17 days. We found that you were in the hospital longer if you were more confused when you were admitted, if you had one of those complications like we just talked about, or if your doctors prescribed a medication for the hallucinations other than medications called quetiapine or clozapine. So I'm gonna pause here for a minute and talk about how do we treat hallucinations in Lewy body dementia in general, and how do we treat them in the hospital? And this is a really, really tough thing. So many of you in the room probably know that we do not have great medications for hallucinations in Lewy body dementia. And in fact, many of the medications used for hallucinations in people, for example, with schizophrenia are dangerous for people with Lewy body dementia. So medications like haloperidol, risperidone, people with Lewy body dementia can have reactions to those medications. And so we have to be really careful. Now, it doesn't mean that it's never appropriate. So if you have a loved one in the room who's been on one of those medications, sometimes you have to try them and there's not a good option. But generally, we say that those medications should be avoided. And if we have to treat hallucinations, we use one of three drugs. We use quetiapine, and the other name for that is Seroquel. We're not sure how well it works, but it's probably the easiest to use. There's a medication called clozapine or clozaril. 
I find that this works really well, but you have to have your blood checked every week for the first six months that you take it, and then every other week for the second six months that you take it, and then once a month for as long as you're on it. So it's a medication that can work pretty well, but it's a pain for you, and it's a pain for your medical team, because not only are you having your blood checked every week, but you don't get your prescription until after your blood is checked. So you're getting a blood draw every week, your doctor's checking it every week, and you're getting a new prescription every week. So that's a lot of work, even though it works pretty well. And then there's a newer medication called Pimavanserin or Nuplazid. That one works a little bit differently. It was studied in people with Parkinson's, not technically, and people with dementia with Lewy bodies, and that you may see commercials for it on TV. Uh, and so that is also used now, but many hospitals don't have that, and it wasn't available at the time we did this research study. So when we looked at, so there, there's a problem in how do we treat hallucinations in general, just when you go see your doctor in the clinic, and then there's also the question of, well, how do you treat hallucinations when they're worse in the hospital? And this is a really tough thing. It's tough for you, it's tough for your doctors, because your doctors really wanna help it, help you. They wanna make them less. They wanna get you out of the hospital as quickly as possible, because we know that you do better when you're out of the hospital, you do better at home. So we, we don't wanna keep you in the hospital, but we can't let you go home if you're having lots of hallucinations. And so it's a really big issue. And so it, it can be tough to figure out what the best thing to do is. So when we looked uh, at, you know, well, did people, about 40% of people with dementia in general will get one of these medications when they're in the hospital because of confusion or hallucinations. And when we looked at this, did this affect how long people were in the hospital if people were taking, given one of those less preferred drugs, one of the drugs we worry about more, they tended to be in the hospital longer. Now, I do wanna caution you that it, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the drug's fault. So maybe their hallucinations were worse, so they needed one of the drugs that we don't usually use, and the, re, the, the fact that the hallucinations were worse were why they were in the hospital longer. So it's not necessarily that those medicines cause the longer hospitalization, but, but there was a, a, a link. And in the Taiwanese study, they found that people were in the hospital longer if they had pneumonia, if they had hip fractures, or if they had diabetes. We also looked at, okay, now you know, you're in the hospital, what's gonna happen next? So we looked at when people were hospitalized, where were they before they had to go to the hospital? And in the people that we looked at, 63% were living at home before they had to go into the hospital. About 30% were either in assisted living or at skilled nursing, and about 2% were already at a rehab facility. And what we found that only a little bit more than half of people who were at home before they were in the hospital were able to go straight back home. Often people needed some rehab before they could go home or they weren't able to, they needed a higher level of care like skilled nursing. We found that about 14% of people with Lewy body dementia went to rehab after they were in the hospital. Um, and we found that 16% either died in the hospital or went to hospice from the hospital. So that's still a minority, but it's not uncommon that if you get really sick with Lewy body dementia or you have one of these problems, it can be hard to recover. So what happens with people who, with Lewy body dementia who are hospitalized, you go home, you go to rehab, well, what can you expect? Well, we know from the research that people with Parkinson's who are in the hospital, they can get physically worse and they can also get mentally worse. And so we know that Parkinson's has this gradual progression and it usually is a slow progression. But then what happens is when you get in the hospital, you kind of take a step down and you do gradually get back, but sometimes you never quite get back to where you were before. And so what we'll see is you'll be on this gradual decline, you'll dip with the hospitalization, you'll gradually get better, though it takes time, but you never quite get back to the same level. 
We see similar things in people with Alzheimer's disease, uh, that they, they take this cognitive step down, in particular when they're in the hospital. And we know if they get delirious, if they get more confused, they have a higher risk of dying in the hospital or going to a nursing home or declining faster after they get out of the hospital. And then I mentioned earlier that about 40% of people with dementia will get these antipsychotics, these hallucination drugs in the hospital, but this can be associated with some risk. So what can you do? You know, so some of that feels kind of frustrating. It's more telling you, well, what to expect if you're in the hospital, but it all seems kind of like, well, okay, well, I'm kind of stuck with it. But there are some things that you can do in particular to get ready and or some resources that you can use either to prepare yourself or if your loved one is in the hospital. Uh, so one thing, um, and I think that shows up pretty well. So this is a screenshot from the Lewy Body Dementia Association website. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the Lewy Body Dementia Association because Michigan is a LBDA research center of excellence but their website is really a wealth of information. One thing that they have on their website, so you can click on this, it's their medical alert wallet card. Some of you may have this. So this is what it looks like. These are the two sides of the medical alert card. You can download these from the LBDA. You can order them from the LBDA. And then I think, do we have, so we have booklets from the LBDA and in one of those booklets from the LBDA, there's actually a tear out version. It's kind of good card stock that you can actually put in your wallet. So on these cards, um, they actually have information for, you know, your, your contact information. What are your allergies? Who's your doctor? What are your other medical conditions? But then on the back, it talks about, well, how do you treat hallucinations in Lewy body dementia? It gives you this warning, and then it talks about these some of the drugs that you should avoid and some of the ones that we think are safer. And then it also gives a link to this website where you or your doctors could get more information. So this is a really handy thing to have in your wallet. Then you don't have to remember it. You don't have to be prepared. Uh, you just, you always have this with you and you can pull it out if you need it. Another thing that the Lewy Body Dementia Association has is caregiver tips for hospital stays. So for the caregivers in the room, what should you be thinking about? Um, and you can read this in advance, but you should also know it's there if your loved one is in the hospital. And then these are some of the tips that they have. So I showed you the screenshot, but here are some of the tips. So I think the first one's pretty obvious, but always tell the physicians about the Lewy body dementia diagnosis. Now, as someone who does research in this space, I can tell you that not all your physicians will know what this is, but you should still tell them. Um, and I think, uh, it, I'm not sure it mentions it here, but it's not a bad idea to have some information about Lewy body dementia with you that you can just hand over to them. So take one of these Lewy body dementia pamphlets. There's also a bigger booklet for families and for physicians. Um, sometimes I'll have families who will order them and they'll kind of carry it in their hospital bag so that they can hand it over. I will say if you're in the ER, short and sweet is probably good. Um, they don't have a time to read a book about Lewy body, but if you can give them a little bit of information or information with these links, that can sometimes be helpful. Let your primary care physician and your neurologist know when your loved one is admitted to the hospital. And this one, different hospital systems feel differently about this, but I mentioned to you that these antipsychotics, these hallucination drugs can have a bad effect. Um, so sometimes uh, it's recommended that you have these listed as an allergy. Now I will say that, that not all doctors will do this. If you haven't had a reaction yet, not everyone will put this on the chart as an allergy, um, but different hospital systems are trying out if there should are automatically be a warning if someone has Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia in the medical record, if you try to prescribe this, a warning may pop up. But that doesn't happen consistently so far. In general, we try not to change Lewy body dementia medications when someone's hospitalized. There are going to be exceptions to that, but uh, usually we try to keep those the same. 
It's also really important to tell your nurses about Lewy body dementia. So if any of you have been in the hospital, you know that the doctors can change a lot. They may change once a week. They may change once every two weeks. Maybe one person on the cha team changes this week. Another person on the team changes next week. And so a nurse is a really valuable point of contact for you. So tell not only your doctor, but it can also be helpful to tell your nurse and also ask your nurse to let you know if there are medications that are started or stopped. It's important for the caregivers in the room to be there when your loved one is in the hospital. So being present, giving reassurance, and helping maintain routines. So we're not really all that great at helping people not get more confused in the hospital, but the more you can have a routine, the more helpful that is. So lights on, windows open in the day, lights off, you know, windows closed at night, trying to help them stay awake during the day as much as possible so they don't get their days and nights mixed up, um, helping them know this is the day, this is the date, this is the time, helping try to give them some sense of where they are and what's happening. So you're a really important part of those routines in the hospital. And then tell the, the nurses and the doctors if you notice a difference, because no one knows your loved one as well as you. And then I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the opportunity to share educations. You may, you may know more about Lewy body dementia than your medical team. And that's frustrating, and that's hard, and that's not the way we want it. But we also know that it's true. Um, and so while it, it isn't your job to be the doctor, because your loved one has a disease that not everyone understands, it's good to have the resources to, to support you when you need to advocate for your loved one. And so I mentioned earlier, this, these are, this is another screenshot from the website, but this book, Lewy Body Dementia Information for Patients, Families, and Professionals, uh, it's the booklet I think is help, more helpful than trying to print it out, but having one of those that you can share can be helpful. Now there are also resources available through the Parkinson Foundation. So I just showed you a number of resources through the Lewy Body Dementia Association. But the Parkinson's Foundation also has good resources. And one of the resources you can order from the Parkinson's Foundation is this patient safety kit. It's also called the Aware and Care Campaign, and it was started in 2011. And this is a campaign that's supposed to help you prepare for hospitalization. It's aimed at Parkinson's, um, but some of you with Lewy body dementia can have Parkinson's disease dementia. And then even if you have dementia with Lewy bodies, there's a lot of overlap. So this kit, this is again from their website, you can order these. And actually, I brought one with. Um, so you can order these from the website. You, it's one per person. They let you order it. Sometimes clinics keep them. I don't know if the Michigan clinic has them or not. But they'll send you this whole kit. And basically what it's supposed to be is it's a bag that you can put all your medication in so you can carry your medication. But then if you order it, it has a bunch of resources inside. It has a card. You can put some of your information. And then inside, it has a bunch of different information that can help you prepare uh, and that you can also take with you if you're hospitalized. So it has uh, like an alert bracelet that says that you have Parkinson's. It also has a wallet card. And on the back of the wallet card, it lists medications uh, that are safe for people with Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia and medications that should be avoided. Uh, it has a couple of special cards if you have deep brain stimulation or a therapy called Duopa, which is used more for people with Parkinson's than dementia with Lewy bodies. It has a Parkinson's fact sheet with information about Parkinson's and medications. And then it has this notepad that has med a fact sheet for nurses. So this talks a little bit about Parkinson's, medications to avoid, and also the importance of getting medication on time every time, which can be a real challenge in the hospital. There are some papers here to prepare you and your medications for being in the hospital. And then there's this booklet called the Aware and Care Hospital Action Plan. 
And so this is a booklet that you can read in advance. It's focused more on Parkinson's, but it also has special sections. Um, and it walks you through what you should think about at home. So uh, packing your kit, preparing for the unexpected, figuring out what hospital you should go to if you, if you have the option. You know, if an ambulance comes, they're gonna take you to the closest one that has room. Um, but if you are driving to a hospital, you might have some choice in where you go. It talks about when you're in the hospital, being vocal, being persistent, advocating for yourself or your loved one, the importance of moving as much as you can. It's really easy to get deconditioned if you're in bed all the time with Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia. So getting therapy, getting out of bed, even just getting to a chair is really important. Um, and then being engaged in your care. And then it also talks about what to do when you get home, making sure that your neurologist knows you are in the hospital, getting a follow-up appointment, um, and connecting with others. There's a checklist for when you know you're going to be in the hospital for a surgery, and also a checklist if you are admitted because of an emergency. And then there's also some information about special considerations, so what you should do if you have memory problems with Parkinson's or if you're confused, and then it also lists those medications that should be avoided. Um, and so all of this comes within this kit here. And so if you're interested, this is a little bit of a different approach than the Lewy Body Dementia Association, but another very helpful resource. All right, so those are, that's what I have for you today. And then I think we have some time for questions. For hallucinations. Yeah. So it's called Pima Vanserin. It's P I M A V A N E R S I N. And the brand name is New Plazid. So it's N U P L A Z I D. So I'll, the brand name is New Plazid. So it's N U P L A Z I D. And it's, so far, it's only been studied in Parkinson's, but some doctors are using it in dementia with Lewy bodies as well. Every medication for hallucinations has what's called a black box warning around it. And a black box warning from the FDA just means that there's something from the FDA that's a safety issue that they want to be really sure that you know. And for any medication for hallucinations, if you have dementia, Antipsychotics have a black box warning. And that means that those medications have an increased risk of death in people with dementia. How big that increased risk uh, varies a bit from medicine to medicine. And often we have to use the medicine anyway because the hallucinations, as many of you know in the room, can be very bad, very severe, scary, can make you do things you don't want to do. And so sometimes even though there is that risk, we have to treat the hallucinations. And so what we try to do is we choose the safest ones out of those families. The Pima Vantron works a little bit differently than the others, but it also has that same black box warning. Yeah, go ahead. So the question, in case you couldn't hear it, is at what point do you go to the hospital with hallucinations? That's a really good question. And I think it also brings up the question of at what point do you treat hallucinations? Kind of a, a similar question. When is the threshold that we should be doing something about the hallucinations? So my own approach for when do we treat the hallucinations is I want those hallucinations to either be bothersome or to be risky. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. But the reason we don't just treat every hallucination is twofold. One, our medications aren't good enough to get rid of the hallucinations. They really only lessen them. But two, I just told you that every one of these medications has an increased risk of death. Even if it's a small increased risk of death, there's that increased risk. And so before I give you a medication that has that risk, I want to be sure that we really need it. And so in general, what I use to guide is, is it really bothersome? So some people have hallucinations that are horrifying. You know, they see people who 
are being murdered, for example. Well, no, that's a terrible way to live. We need to do something about that. Or sometimes it could be a safety issue. So here in Michigan, you know, you look out the window and you see, think you see kids playing outside in the winter and you go to investigate and you're not wearing a coat and it's nighttime and, you know, your family is sleeping and they don't know and then you're outside in the snow. So that's a, that's a safety issue. And so I try to tease out with you, is this bothersome enough to treat or is this risky enough to treat? And if so, then we use uh, medication. From a hospital perspective, for me, it would really be if there was a change. So if there was a sudden increase, that would be a signal to me, well, is there an infection you know, that we need to find and take care of now? Or have the hallucinations suddenly become dangerous? So uh, is the person hallucinating and they think that you are a thief in the house so that's, that could be a hallucination or a delusion, and they're attacking the caregiver because they're confused. Well, that's a safety issue for both of you, and so that would be a reason to go to the hospital. So it's not the day-to-day -day hallucinations, but uh, is it a change that would make you think something else might be happening that we could treat, like an infection, or is it a safety issue for you or them that needs to get handled right away? There's no perfect answer, but those are some of the things I would think about here in front, and then we'll go in back. Dr. Ar oh, thank you. Dr. Armstrong, yeah. as, as far as hallucinations, the treatment of delusions, is there a difference? That's a great question. So the question was hallucinations versus delusions. So maybe we should take a step back for a minute and say, well, what are the, the differences between the two things? So a hallucination is when you experience something through your senses that isn't there. And sometimes if you're experiencing it, you don't know yourself. In Lewy body dementia, the most common kind of hallucinations is visual. So you see things that aren't there. But there are other kinds. So you can hear things that other people can't hear. You smell things that other people can't smell. Or you feel things. You feel like bugs are crawling on you. And people tell you that they're not there. So hallucinations come in different forms, but visual is the most common. A delusion is when someone believes something that's not true, uh, and there is absolutely nothing you can do to convince them of that fact. Uh, and it has nothing to do with politics. It has to do <laughs> with things like uh, thinking that there is a, uh, thinking that there is a robber in the house. Um, thinking that someone has stolen all your money, uh, thinking that your spouse has a new girlfriend or a new boyfriend. Um, and it doesn't matter what you say or what you show them. It doesn't matter. You take them through the house and show them that there is no one in the home. You just cannot convince them that this is wrong. So that's a, that would be a delusion. Um, so they're different things, but usually we treat them the exact same way. We treat them with medications for hallucinations. The Pima Vanster and the new Plaza, the new one, they looked specifically at delusions when they did that research study in Parkinson's, and they found that it helped delusions for some of the people with Parkinson's in the study. For most of the other drugs, the research isn't that rigorous, but we end up treating them the same way. I think they're, yeah. In the presentation, uh, infections showed up several times. Uh, kind of new at this. What is the common cause of the infections? What type of infections are they? What should we look for? That's a great question. So there are far and away, there are two, the top two infections we see are urinary tract infections and pneumonia. Uh, so urinary tract infections, uh, we, they're pretty common. Um, they're probably partly related to the Lewy body. We know that when you have Lewy body dementia, sometimes people will um, uh, have more trouble urinating or they'll retain some of the urine. We, you heard that Lewy body dementia is more common in men. Men more, uh, more commonly have things like prostate issues too, so there may be more than one reason, especially in men, that you have urine challenges, and so that may make it a little bit easier for you to get a urinary tract infection. It's important to know that you may or may not get urine symptoms with your urinary tract infection. 
So it could be if you have a UTI, you might go to the bathroom more frequently, but sometimes you're going to the bathroom frequently anyway, or it might burn. Um, those would be clues. But a lot of times people with urinary tract infections, the only signal you have that that's happening is that your Lewy body dementia symptoms get worse. So you're, you're slower, you're stiffer, you're shaking more, you're more confused, you're hallucinating more. And so whenever someone calls me, usually it's the caregiver calling and says, oh my gosh, you know, everything is worse. Like the last two days, everything is worse. The first thing I have them do is get a, a urine analysis to see if there's an infection because that's probably the most common reason for a sudden change and we can treat that. You know, you get on antibiotics, usually through your primary care physician. I'll admit I haven't kept up on all the antibiotics, and so I usually have people work with their primary care for what antibiotic is right for them, uh, and then that can help the symptoms. Number two is pneumonia, especially when you're a little bit later in your Lewy body dementia. It can affect your swallowing, and it can make, harder, make it harder to swallow correctly. Some clues about that would be if you cough when you eat or if you cough when you drink, that makes us wonder if it's going down the wrong pipe. But it can go down the wrong pipe and you would never even know. It's called a silent aspiration. But when your food or when your fluid, your liquid goes down into your lungs instead of into your stomach, you can get a pneumonia. And then you can also just get the regular kind of pneumonia from a bug. So there are multiple reasons that you can get pneumonia, and that is another common kind of uh, infection. I personally recommend that all of the people I see with Lewy body dementia stay up to date on their vaccinations so that you, you're doing everything you can to avoid getting sick. Other questions? Way in the back. So do you think the potential UTI has anything to do with the fluctuation in cognition in somebody with LBD? So that's a, a, another great question. So there's no doubt that if you get a UTI, you can get fluctuations in cognition. Uh, and that kind of is that fluctuation that we see with the delirium in response to an infection. But we also know that people fluctuate in dementia with Lewy bodies without any kind of infection at all. Uh, and those inf uh, fluctuations can differ. So some people have, you know, minute by minute or hour by hour fluctuations. It's not uncommon to have good days and bad days. Some people will describe what we call nobody's home episodes. So you're, you or your loved one will be kind of sitting there and glazed. You know, like, hello, hello, anyone home? Um, so that's another kind of fluctuation. And they don't, while urinary tract infections can certainly trigger fluctuations, we know that they're also just a part of the disease, completely apart from infection, and we don't have a good reason for why they're happening. Another theory that's been shown in some research but not other research is that some of it may be with blood pressure fluctuations. So when blood pressure is low, some people will be less responsive, and when blood pressure is normal, they'll be more responsive. And so there may be a component of that too, but that also has failed to explain all of it. So there's still some unknown about why those are so common in Lewy body dementia. Here in the front. Related at all to um, myoclonus or an early age diagnosis of Lewy body dementia? So there are a couple of questions in there. So one of the questions had to deal with um, to do with mixed diagnoses. So uh, just thinking about that at a high level, we know it's really common for people to have more than one problem in the brain. And there was a study published last year that looked at people with dementia who underwent autopsy. And 90% of them, this was across all dementias, had more than one problem in the brain that could affect memory and thinking. And we know in particular with Lewy body dementia, many people with Lewy body dementia have some Alzheimer's changes in the brain as well, if we look after they die. That doesn't necessarily mean they meet criteria for Alzheimer's disease dementia, but some of those changes are happening. And we do know that some people have both. 
because both get more common as you get older, and having Parkinson's or having Lewy body dementia doesn't stop you from getting Alzheimer's in any way, and so there are people that have both diagnoses and both diseases. Uh, we don't know if that makes it uh, harder in the hospital or easier to get confused in the hospital, but you'd certainly think so. You have more than one thing happening. You have more than one reason to be confused and have poor memory already. So I think hospitalization can be even rougher in those circumstances. Uh, and then you mentioned myoclonus. Myoclonus is a physical problem where you have sudden jerks. Um, and that can happen in both Alzheimer's and Lewy body. That has to do with, we talked early about where those Lewy body clumps, um, and depending on where they clump, they can cause different symptoms, and the myoclonus uh, can happen with that, and it can happen in both. So to me, it doesn't help distinguish between Alzheimer's and Lewy body. It can happen with both of them. It's not super common in either, but it can happen with both. So, yeah, so the question is about, is, is there any research on early onset Lewy body? Um, so, in, you know, earlier in life, so very rarely late 50s. Uh, um, would, that would be pretty uncommon, but we see it, or 60s, and then some people don't get Lewy body till they're in their 80s. There's not a lot of research on that yet. Yeah. What is the uh, difference, or is... Is there a difference uh, for people who act out dreams? Is that a hallucination or a delusion? Uh, so that is a great question. So she asked about acting out dreams. So acting out dreams itself isn't a hallucination or a delusion. So it is actually something called a REM sleep behavior disorder. I'm going to unpack that for you. So when we go through REM sleep, that's one of our sleep stages, that's when we dream. And normally when we dream, our bodies are actually paralyzed during that stage of sleep. That's why so many of us have those dreams where like you're running, but you feel like you can't run. It's because you literally can't run. Your body is paralyzed as you're dreaming. But in people with diseases in the Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia family, they lose that sleep paralysis. And so when they dream that they're running, they actually start running in bed because they're not paralyzed. And so people with this family of diseases, if they're in a fight, you know, they, can, they fight in their sleep and they may hit their bed partner. Um, they can fall out of bed. Uh, they can talk. Talking alone isn't enough. It really has to be to be predictive of something in the Parkinson's family. And we now know that this is strongly associated with things in the Parkinson's family can even happen 10 and 15 years before any symptoms of Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies. So that is, a, is um, a separate symptom, and it has to do with those Lewy bodies building up kind of in the, in the back and the bottom of the brain. Now, I will say that when people have hallucinations at night, uh, those are, we generally consider them a little bit less of a big deal if, if they happen as people are waking up. I'm sure many people in this room have had times when you wake up for a dream and in a minute, for a minute you're like, you know, where am I? Am I dreaming? Am I awake? You know, the, the dream gradually fades. And so if people are mostly hallucinating as they're waking up from sleep, um, I think that's a little bit easier when you have Lewy body dementia because it takes a little bit longer for you to get reoriented. And I usually don't treat that because that's, it's a hallucination, but it's strongly tied to waking up from the dream state. Um, I would be more likely to treat hallucinations that are happening during the day. So you can hallucinate at night or have a harder time coming out of dreams, but that acting out of dreams is a totally separate thing, but strong re strongly related to the Parkinson's family of diseases. Yeah, in the yellow. Is there any evidence, um, we thought we saw this in my mom, who was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia, but she had Parkinson's-like movement issues. Yeah. Is there any evidence that um, one may show perceptual, like depth perception, 
or um, depth perception in the sense of like banging into things or thinking that they could carry something that's way too heavy um, before they're showing any other kinds of symptoms or not much in other symptoms. But we seem to remember that my mom was getting bruised and banged up so much before anything else showed up. And then later on when we learned about Lewy body dementia, we wondered if that was an early symptom. So there's not, so there, I think most of you heard that because she had the microphone. The question is about early symptoms uh, before people are diagnosed with dementia with Lewy bodies. There is not a lot of research or publication about the depth perception issue. Um, there's a lot of interest right now in identifying pre-dementia with Lewy body states. And there are three proposed. I don't think you should, these aren't really set in stone, but the, the three that are currently considered are, the first one is when people have mild cognitive problems. And usually the mild cognitive problems that are seen in people who go on to have dementia with Lewy bodies are things like uh, poor judgment and trouble problem solving. So kind of those higher level tasks. Um, so if those are there, they're a decline from prior, those are things that are measurable on that neuropsychological, that memory testing that like takes three or four hours, they can find that. And if you have those, they call them executive problems, so trouble problem solving, making poor decisions, you have a higher risk of going on to get dementia with Lewy bodies, not guaranteed, but a higher risk. The second kind of early pathway is the delirium that we talked about. So not everyone who gets delirious in the hospital will go on to get dementia with Lewy bodies, but that is one of kind of the warning signs, they think. And then the third way is people who have hallucinations in older age, but nothing else. So for some people, they think that the hallucinations are first, everything else looks fine, but there's no other explanation for the hallucinations, and then it goes on to develop dementia with Lewy bodies. So right now, there are kind of thought to be these three early states that go on to develop DLB, and that visual, perceptual, those you know, trouble with where you are in space hasn't been well described, but it also went, it seems plausible because those are things we see in dementia with Lewy bodies, and they've got to start sometime, and it's not like you go from normal to dementia overnight. So we do expect that some of these things we see in dementia with Lewy bodies start gradually. So while it's not described, it would certainly be plausible to me. Do you see people with Lewy body with with the Lewy body where they do not get the hallucinations and do they then develop the hallucinations as the disease progresses? Absolutely. So you do not have to have hallucinations to get a, di a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. So to get that diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, you need the dementia. So that's required. Um, and then there are four core clinical features. So fluctuations, those ups and downs, visual hallucinations, the REM sleep behavior disorder where you act out your dreams, and then Parkinson-like features. And you only need two of the four to get the diagnosis. There are some other nuances there too, but, but if you have dementia and then two of the four, you get the diagnosis. Some people will never have hallucinations. Some will never have Parkinson symptoms. I would say that the people who don't have hallucinations, I think, are at a higher risk of misdiagnosis because especially people who aren't too familiar with Lewy body dementia often think of hallucinations as a big thing, but you don't have to have them. As you go on, you are more likely to get them over time, but some people die with dementia with Lewy bodies having never had a hallucination, so you don't have to have it. Yeah? What does a diagnosis of uh, Lewy body dementia with behavioral tendencies mean? Uh, so um, when we think about giving a diagnosis from the medical side, we are beset not only with criteria for what we think you have, but the codes we have to assign when we are seeing you in clinic. Uh, right now, across the world, uh, doctors use ICD-10. It's the International Classification of Diseases. Uh, the United States was actually the last to adopt the ICD-10 diagnosis system, and that's what your doctor 
has to say when they see you in clinic and they send a bill to your insurance, they have to give you a, a billing diagnosis, and we have a set list that we have to pick from. And in ICD-10, you, you have various options, but some of them are Lewy body dementia with behavioral disturbance or Lewy body dementia without behavioral disturbance. And that behavioral disturbance is often used to mean, do you have hallucinations? It could also mean, do you have bad depression or bad anxiety? Those are different things under the behavioral umbrella. But just kind of like in talking about these things, we don't use that with or without behavioral disturbance. That's really a, a term used in doctor's offices to code, and we're kind of stuck with what they give us. You're welcome. Uh, there's one. Dr. Armstrong, has there been any significant discoveries regarding Louis, de Louis body dementia in the last 12 months? Uh, so I would say, so when I think about significant research in the field, I think it's helpful to think about the whole family of Lewy body diseases, thinking not only about Lewy body dementia, but also about Parkinson's. And the reason that I think about them both together when I think about research is because if we think about what is the research that is going to lead us to a cure, what is the le research that is going to lead us to slow down these diseases? We're thinking about that protein in the brain. How do we stop the alpha-synuclein from clumping? You know, that would slow it down or stop it. And that kind of research is really going to be done in people with Parkinson's because it's more common, it's easier to study. Um, and the good news from a Lewy body dementia standpoint is if it works in Parkinson's, it's the same protein, so it should work in people with Lewy body dementia of either kind as well. So in Parkinson's disease, when we think about things to slow down that clumping, to slow down the diseases, there's been good news and bad news over the last 12 months. So there have been two drug trials trying to slow down the Parkinson's, and both of them were negative. So neither of those two drugs helped. There was a research study that was published in 2018 in people with early Parkinson's, so very early diagnosed, where they looked at exercise, and they looked at high-intensity exercise. So the people in those research studies, they did treadmill. They did treadmill to 85% of their target heart rate, so they were really pumping. They did it four days a week for a half an hour at a time with some warm-up and cool-down. And in that study, the group that did the high-intensity exercise seemed to have a slower progression of the Parkinson's. So that was super exciting because we don't have anything to slow it down or stop it. And now there's a study that says maybe exercise will slow it down. And so the National Institute of Health is actually funding a follow-up study because that was still an early study to look at a much larger group of people with Parkinson's um, to see if they can confirm that high-intensity exercise might slow it down. There are also some studies underway looking at a, a kind of vaccine for people with Parkinson's that's trying to stop the clumping of the alpha-synuclein. Three different drug companies are all developing the same kind of vaccine, and those are all in early clinical trials right now. Uh, if they help in Parkinson's, you can be sure they will be tried in all forms of the Lewy body uh, diseases. Um, with regard to medication, there have been some trials reported in the last 12 months in DLB, but none of them made a big difference. So we've had more negative trials than positive trials. Um, but I think the fact that there are more drugs being tested in DLB is something of a, a triumph in itself. For a long time, drug companies had no interest in developing drugs for DLB. So the fact that we have some enrolling clinical trials right now is a really positive thing even though the first couple didn't show clear benefit. I think we have time for one more question. Barry, I'm coming. Uh, in pharmacy, is LBD still being treated as an, or as an orphan? Uh, say it again. Is LBD in the, f in, in the field of pharmacy, is it still being treated as an orphan? Is oh, is it an orphan uh, disease? Yes. Uh, 
I am not completely sure. So orphan disease classification um, is something that uh, can be used by, uh, like, the FDA. You need uh, to show let, you know, um, benefit in a smaller group of people uh, to, to get approval for the drug, and I'm not completely sure about that. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry I don't have the answer for that one. Great discussion. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And how about a round of applause for Dr. Armstrong?